Robin, would you like to add about your uh, publishing experiences and how you got to print? Yeah, um, all right. So I started like properly querying a book when I was 18 um, that I thought was better than what I had been writing because I've been writing for about six years at that point. And it was maybe book number five. John, and, is my heart um, in your room? About like my second month of college, I had an offer from an agent who wanted to represent it, and then a couple yes, of months later, we line. sold it. And so I was 18, and I was a published author, and Are you it was an interesting now? I can walk experience, there and get I didn't it think the book was ready, I think oh, they wanted no it to be ready, so um, they thought it was like, head back that way. Just let me know. And I'm really glad I've been able to pass that and have my career keep going okay, well, and get over the hurdle of being that kind of like very young, like shoved into the front of the room, isn't this cute, she wrote a book, you guys, to someone like, um, she wrote nightly, which is really nice. So, you know, I was, I was always writing when I was in school, but I never wanted to be a writer because I wasn't getting to write what I wanted. I was having to write things that were similar to Gossip Girl, and I was just sitting around not reading that kind of thing at home, and I was like, I don't really think I believe in what I'm producing, and that's, that's terrifying, because I know you can, you know, that, that wasn't that wasn't something I wanted to do. I wanted to make a difference or not do it. Um, so, so I started studying medicine and science, and in the background, I was writing always fantasy books, and Knightley was one of them. So I was the only girl in this mechanical engineering course, and everyone made fun of me. And I would go home, and instead of doing my problem sets, I would go to a cafe, and I would write about this outcast out of boarding school for nights, and everyone like bullied him and made fun of him. And so I started doing that, and um, I gave it to my agent at that time, and I said, this is very different, and he said, I love it. Um, let's pitch it, let's not even put your name on it, let's see what happens, and the series sold. I had to defer actually um, graduate school in medicine, and I moved to London to write, and I had like 10 weeks to write pretty much three quarters of the book. So I did, um, and then it got published while I was in graduate school for medicine, and um, all of my classmates made fun of me because I wrote fantasy novels mm -hmm. instead of, you know, doing like a cancer research. <laughs> and, um, <laughs> but that's why we're here raising money for the that's cancer alliance. That's why we're raising money, yes, for, for, all of these, for all of these wonderful charities. Um, but yes, yeah, so that was my story. I was really fortunate to be published young, and I was extraordinarily more fortunate that I was able to turn it into a career that I wanted to have as opposed to what they envisioned for me. Because so many of these, like, oh, this author is 13, like six, seven years later, you hear nothing. Um, and I'm really glad that I can do it. Thank you very much. Uh, you both have some wonderful primary settings. Uh, Knightley Academy, of course, and Athens Academy in Strangely Beautiful. Um, are these settings based on any real-world locations? Not Athens. Um, Athens is, is sort of a, a plot device for everything that happens inside of it. Um, but it is, the basis for the school is, is uh, created off of a Quaker model. And the Quakers have always been um, historically, some of the most progressive in the realms of education, the Quakers being a, a religious group, um, a Protestant uh, religious group that has its foundings in England and also in America um, in the 1700s, and had suffered a, a great deal of persecution. The Quakers did both, uh, well, more so in England than, it, than they did in America. Um, so uh, the Quakers were progressive. They were they were abolitionists. They were against slavery, and they also were for uh, co-educational education of women. They didn't necessarily think that women should have to be, you know, shuffled off to the side. Um, they they had you know meeting houses where women were allowed to speak. Uh, they were allowed to have positions within the the clergy and and the structure of the church that that was sort of unheard of in other religious organizations. <laughs> So they were really, really revolutionary in a lot of ways, and because of that, that's also why they were persecuted. So I have that Athens is a Quaker Academy, and they keep it very, very, very secret that they have co-educational uh, education. And not just that they're educating girls, that they're educating girls in things like math, which mm -hmm. is something that was unheard of. If there were finishing schools, um, as there were, of course, in the 19th century, um, they were, you know, you learned painting and how to cook and sew and do things like that, and how to manage a household. You were taught business. But it was business of home. It was certainly not a business that you would ever run yourself. So the women's education was extremely limited. Even when there were separate women's colleges, what was allowed to be taught in those colleges was very, very, very small uh, in scope. So um, I try and subvert that with Athens. Also, I want I wanted to have a situation in which you know a professor and a student are in a room together. <laughs> <laughs> 
my answer is no. <laughs> no elements at all? <laughs> um, is, is it based on anything? Um, not really. Um, it's just this fictitious boarding school in my mind that's just a mishmash of styles. Um, I don't know. Came about. I, I don't know. I guess it's based on reading a lot of Diana Wynne Jones and Joe Rowling. <laughs> okay, thank you. Uh, some people say a true mark of literary success is finding fan fiction based on your work. <laughs> Do you know of any? <laughs> Have you read it, and what has your reaction been? I just discovered it the other day! <laughs> My friend was like, look, you've got fan fiction! And I was like, sweet, I made it! <laughs> I found out, I, I haven't read it yet, because I'm having, I'm having my friends read it for me. Um, no, I just discovered the cover art, and I was like, oh look, there's Percy and Alexi, that's nice. Um, and there's a sense of Persephone Parker fan fiction, how about that? Um, yeah, so I just, I just sort of squealed. It was actually in the same week that I found out that a, a, a fan had done a character animation of my hero and heroine, literally animated them. Um, and so I have a little um, Disney Princess Percy cartoon on my blog, which is the coolest thing ever. And um, and also somebody asked my permission for a Strange and Beautiful tattoo all in the same week. So I was like, I have arrived. <laughs> um, yeah, I, I have, there's some lovely gay slash. Um, <laughs> see, I think I'm happy because mine's canonical. It's like with the hero and heroine. I wish. No, mine is, I don't know how many of you've read it, but it's um, Theobald and Valmont in the closet. <laughs> um, written by a very lovely 12 year old boy who emailed it to me personally. Um, I was like, aw, thanks, kiddo. Um, <laughs> so that's. Um, I, I think I, I skimmed it, and then I realized that I was actually internally horrified in a way that I had very rarely ever been, so I just stepped away quietly. Um, I, I don't know if there's one. Oh, there was an RPG. A bunch of kids started a nightly, if they, if they bought the domain, I'm so upset, they bought nightlyacademyrpg.com, and they put it up, and I'm like, wow. Um, yeah. So they had an RPG going, of, like role play the year at Nightly Academy, and they started accepting girls. Oh. Yes. <laughs> Yeah, that's why there's one female character. I was like, okay, well tell me about like balance people in the closet at least, but I I don't want to know. Okay. But this question is for Robin. Uh, while reading nightly, I was pleased to find quite a few geeky Easter eggs placed throughout the text. Uh, my favorite was when Henry opens his textbook to page 42. Uh, were there any Easter eggs very few people found, and can we expect more of these in the sequel? you might not have found. I don't know. There are a lot of references in there. Um, a lot of people are reading into it because they know there's Easter eggs, and they're like, oh, is Jasper named after Jasper Hale from Twilight? And I'm like, I'm like yeah! Like, oh my god, thanks so much for, no. <laughs> Look, short answer, no. Um, th there's a lot of Easter eggs in there. I think in in The Secret Prince, I was doing Doctor Who online. I was having to watch episodes of Doctor Who three times a week and recap them, um, like full like synopses and episode summaries while I was on book deadline. So the, the villain of The Secret Prince is the mad doctor with his little blue box. Um, it means something completely different. Like when people say it and they're chill, they're like, he'll cure you of your health. And he's always like a Mangala character, you know? <laughs> and it's different. Um, so there's definitely that. I don't know, I think it, there's a lot of very quiet references to things like Harry Potter and the Christ Romancy books and uh, like Peter Pan, there are a bunch of Peter Pan things. I don't know, I just, I have a lot of fun when I'm writing and I feel like if you, if you don't get the references and you're still reading the story and you're not like, oh, this is like a blatant ha-ha that detracts from the text, you know, so, so long as it's not like that. I, I love them and they're really fun. So let me know which ones you find, but the 42 ones. Okay. This question is for Liana. Strangely mentions various hauntings that occur in London. Are any of these real and part of London's supernatural history? Yes, every single one that's outside of Adams Academy is a documented London haunt. It was my favorite part of all of my research. Um, Richard Jones, who runs, uh, who does Most Haunted, uh, the, the show, um, at least started on the first few seasons of Most Haunted in England, um, he's been my foremost research uh, re resource. 
Um, I go to him. I actually am now uh, I'm acquainted with him. He came to my book signing in London. It was wonderful. He's a wonderful, wonderful man. Um, he writes a bunch of books, for, uh, has written a bunch of books for Barnes & Noble about haunted London. So those are just my tomes. I go through and I pick ghost stories I like and I make sure that my Ghostbusters encounter them on the street um, one way or another. Now the ghosts within Athens Academy, those are characters I had to create to further various plots and to be Percy's friends. Um, but, um, but yeah, that's, that's probably my favorite thing. And I, I certainly, as far as the Easter eggs, I also have, uh, I've got a bunch of Shakespearean references. They're just over Shakespearean references. So a lot of my Easter eggs, you know, certainly some Harry Potter tropes within the novels, but I have a lot of Easter eggs for like fans of Gothic novels. Cause I, essentially my series are, they're Gothic novels in the sense of the capital G, Gothic style, high drama, women in nightgowns running into the rain, screaming, <laughs> crying, fainting. <laughs> I don't know if that was the answer you're looking for, but yes, yes, the ghosts are real, they really are. They really are. Like, uh, bloody bones. And, yeah, bloody uh, bones is totally real, and, uh, and it's terrifying. The sure. black piece real, I mean. <laughs> <laughs> Alright, um, we're going to lock you up with bloody bones and see how well you bear. There have been men who have ejected themselves from the window onto the spiked gate below and impaled themselves. Let's see how well you do. <laughs>